Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you always with thanksgiving. Our hearts are filled with gratitude, O oh God, for all the things that you do for us. And even those that you do that we don't know or realize. Father, we are so, so grateful. Thank you for life. Thank you for health. Thank you for provision. Thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, our blessed teacher. As we go into the word this morning, Father, open the eyes of our understanding. Give us clarity of thought. Help us to understand what we read and what we're learning. But more importantly, help us to be able to live it out. Because Jesus, you came and you demonstrated that this life is possible to live. We give you thanks and we give you praise in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you all. You're welcome to Bible Fellowship this morning. It's great to see everyone. We have been studying the book of Ezekiel. This is I believe Bible Fellowship and we're in Houston, Texas. We stopped yesterday at chapter nine and chapter nine was packed. I mean, I don't think we have ever spent one entire uh, hour on, on looking at one chapter of scripture, but it was good. Uh, we continue from chapter 10, uh, verse one. Then I looked and behold in the firmament that was above the head of the cherubims there appeared over them as it were a sapphire stone as the appearance of the likeness of a throne. And he spake unto the man clothed with linen and said, go in between the wheels, even under the cherub, and fill thine hand with coals of fire from between the cherubims and scatter them over the city. And he went in, in my sight. Now the cherubim stood on the right side of the house when the man went in and the cloud filled the inner court. Then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub and stood over the threshold of the house. And the house was filled with the cloud and the court was full of the brightness of the Lord's glory. And the sound of the cherubim's wings was heard even to the outer court as the voice of the almighty God when he speaketh. And it came to pass that when he had commanded the man clothed with linen saying, take fire from between the wheels from between the cherubims then he went in and stood beside the wheels. And one cherub stretched forth his hand from between the cherubims unto the fire that was between the cherubims and took thereof and put it into the hands of him that was clothed with linen, who took it and went out. And there appeared in the cherubims the form of a man's hand under the wings. And when I looked, behold, the four wheels of the cherubims one wheel by one cherub and another wheel by another cherub and the appearance of the wheels was as the color of a burial stone and as for the appearances they four had one likeness as if a wheel had been in the midst of a wheel when they went they went upon their four sides they turned not as they went but to the place whither the head looked they followed they followed it they turned not as they went and their whole body and their backs and their hands and their wings and the wheels were full of eyes round about, even the wheels that they four had. As for the wheels, it was cried unto them in my hearing, O wheel. And everyone had four faces. The first face was the face of a cherub, and the second face was the face of a man, and the third, the face of a lion, and the fourth, the face of an eagle. And the cherubims were lifted up, this is the living creature that I saw by the river of Chebar. And when the cherubims went, the wheels went by them. And when the cherubims lifted up their wings to mount up from the earth, the same wheels also turned not from beside them. When they stood, these stood. And when they were lifted up, these lifted up themselves also, for the spirit of the living creature was in them. Then the glory of the Lord departed from off the threshold of the house, and stood over the cherubims. And the cherubims lifted up their wings and mounted up from the earth in my sight when they went out. The wheels also were beside them, and everyone stood at the door of the east gate of the Lord's house, and the glory of the God of Israel was over them. This is the living creature that I saw under the God of Israel by the river of Chebar, and I knew that they were cherubims. Everyone had four faces apiece, and everyone had four wings, 
and the likeness of the hands of a man was under the wings, and the likeness of their faces was the same faces which I saw by the river of Chabar. Their appearances and themselves, they went everyone straight forward. Praise God. Again, as we know, God dealt with Ezekiel uh, during his ministry with a lot of imagery. And as I said before, it's, it's difficult for a man to put words to a heavenly vision unless God just helps the person to be able to express what it is that they're seeing. You'll see that uh, Ezekiel repeats himself a lot because he, he can't find the words to express the incredulity of what he was seeing, what he was witnessing. Um, this particular chapter, I'm sure, will unfold as we read subsequent chapters, but it's similar to what we read at the beginning of the book in chapters one and two, where he first saw the Lord in this vision at uh, the river of Chebar. Um, the instructions are clear. It's still um, judgmental because he was told to go and get coals of fire and to scatter it all over the city of Jerusalem. And uh, it wasn't necessarily um, coals of fire like that. It was just indicative of the fact that hard times were going to come upon the people of God because of their apostasy, because of their idolatry, and because of their stiff nakedness. Sometimes God, uh, I want to say God really doesn't mind, in quotes, when we are in sin or in error, and I said in quotes, please don't misunderstand me. I want to compare it to what I'm about to say next. He really doesn't mind you falling or being in sin. What he absolutely abhors is for you to remain stubborn and not to turn away from wickedness. That's what really angers God. He, he says in Psalms 103, he knows your frame. He remembers that you're dust. And as the father pities his children, so the Lord pities them that fear him. So God understands. That's not to say that he condones it. He does understand that we're grappling with the Lord and we're dealing with the law and that we will fall. But he has mercy and he has love to catch us during those times when we miss it. What really, really gets to God is for someone to hear the truth or know the truth and refuse to live by truth. If God has sent conviction, if God has sent someone to tell you, if you pick up a book or a magazine and it's talking exactly about stuff that's going on in your life, or, or God has many ways of trying to reach us, is what I'm trying to say. And if he has tried to do all of that and you still remain stubborn, that's when God gets upset. Those of us that are parents, you understand what I'm saying. If your child does something wrong and you chastise the child, and the child runs into you, your arms, or, or well, not into your arms because you're probably too tall, but runs to you and just puts their arm around your th thighs or your waist because that's how tall they are. What, what are you going to do? Your heart is going to melt and you'll forget whatever it is that the child did. But if the child does something and you chastise the child and the child has an attitude with you and the child is stubborn and you're saying go to your room and the child is defiant, you get more upset. It's the same thing with our father. Once he lets us know that we're in error and we repent, it's done. He wipes the slate clean every time. He wipes it clean. You're the one who goes to dig up those things. God never does. In that same Psalm 103, he says, as far as the east is from the west, so have I removed your transgression from you. And I saw something uh, because sometimes on social media, you'll see some good things. I saw something on Instagram a few weeks ago. This guy said, um, from, from north to south, um, you get to a point where you start, you're no longer heading south, you begin to head north. If you look at the globe, uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying it exactly as it says it, but as he said it, but you'll understand what I'm trying to say. If you look at the globe um, and you start from the North Pole, you start heading south. When you get to the South Pole, you then begin to head uh, north. But if you look at it along the lines of the equator, 
once you start heading east, you will forever head east. There's no time that you begin to head west unless you stop and you turn around, which is what I'm trying to say here. When God corrects us and we stop and we turn around, he wipes the slate clean. But if you continue in that path and you're heading east, you will always head east. That's why the path of sin is decadent. It just goes from bad to worse to worse. So it's in your best interest to just stop short of it, repent of it, and tell the Lord, I'm sorry, and turn around. That's the only way you can begin to go in the right direction. I tell my children, I told my children when they were little, I said, when a man is walking down a road, and the road forks, and he takes the wrong turn, let's say he turns right, and that's the wrong turn. As long as you remain on that right turn, you go further and further and further away from your destination. And the only way to correct that error is to come back to where the road forks and then engage the right turn. So sin is not worth it, is what I'm saying to you. Wrongdoing is not worth it, is what I'm saying to you. The more you continue along that path, the more you go away from your, uh, your destination or your destiny, if you like. So God is saying to them, I'm still going to judge. But then in that judgment, there is also mercy. Because fire doesn't just burn. There's a scripture that's coming to me now. And uh, if somebody's still on the call, please help me. Peggy, the people who usually help me. It's a scripture that talks about the fact that when, when someone offends you, uh, um, don't, don't retaliate. Because um, if, you, if you don't retaliate, you, you pour burning coals on their head. Someone look for that scripture for me. I want to look at it. Because fire doesn't just burn. Fire also purifies. Okay? So sometimes when the wrath of God is poured out, when the fury of God is poured out, it's not necessarily to destroy. God is not a destructive God. It's, it's part of it. Part of his judgment is to purify and to turn you around from a path that he obviously knows the end. Because our God knows the end from the beginning. And what you cannot see, he sees. And so when he tells you, turn around, turn around, walk away, forget that friend, break that relationship, don't go to that place. When he tells you those things, it's for your own good. Let me see. Um, I'm not sure that's the one I'm looking for. But let me see. Proverbs 25, right? Right, Jewel? Jewel? Yeah. Yes, 25, 22. I mean, my car, um, the one you're looking for is in the Gospels. It's in the Gospels, it's in, yes. It's in the Gospels. Sorry, but I'm driving. I think I can't tell you exactly which. Ma I, I know it's in Matthew and it's also in Luke. Anyway, somebody Google it. It's clear. It says if you pray for this person that, that does you wrong, it's like you're heaping coals of fire on the person. And the real meaning of that scripture is not coals of fire so that the person can just burn to blazes and, and clear out of your life and clear out of your way. That's not the reason for the coals of fire. The coals of fire is to purify the person because if somebody does you wrong and you love them and they do you wrong and you love them, and I'm not talking about being stupid. Please understand me. Love is not stupid. There are boundaries that you must set. It's one thing for someone to be taken advantage of your goodness. It's another thing for somebody to be in error and you love them through the era, okay? But back to our, 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 our scripture in Ezekiel chapter 10, this, the sprinkling of the fire is not just judgmental. There's also an angle of mercy in it because fire also purifies, okay? So uh, in, in his wrath and in his judgment, we still see his mercy. Um, Ezekiel takes the time and the patience to describe the cherubim that he sees, all right? Um, and like I told you, I, I don't bother myself with these details because the Bible says, now we know in part, and I think that's First Corinthians chapter 13. It says, now we know in part. It's time is coming when we're going to know exactly as we are known. Nothing is going to be hid from us anymore. Let me give you that, that reference. Um, 
it's First Corinthians 13, um, verse 12. He says, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face, now we know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. So we, we know in part and we see dimly now, but the day is going to come when we're going to stand before the presence of the living God and we will know exactly as we are known. We will have full understanding of everything that has been before and that will be uh, in, in, in time to come. He attempts to describe what he's saying. Uh, he talks about four wheels, but I personally, Pastor Mo, personally, I don't think it's a wheel in the sense of what we know a wheel to be. I don't know exactly what it is that he's describing, but the way he's talking about it, um, I don't think it's a wheel. All right. But that's my own personal opinion. He says uh, there were four wheels by the cherubim, one wheel by one cherub and another wheel by another cherub. And the appearance of the wheels was as the color of burial stone. And as for the appearances, they four had one likeness as if a wheel had been in the midst of a wheel. Does it make sense to me? No. And I'm not ashamed to say I don't understand it because I'm not God. That's why I say to you, I'm not going to worry myself about it. When the time comes for us to know what we need to know, we will know it. What we do not know, we accept by faith because we trust the God who said it. All right. Um, I also want to correct an impression that you might have because you and I have seen pictures of cherubs. They draw this little baby with tiny little wings, uh, often on a cloud with a, a hand under the chin. That is nothing like a cherub. All right, a cherub is not a tiny angel. I don't know who came up with that lie. There is no angel that's tiny. They are not born and they don't grow. They are spirit beings, not born by anybody and they are not growing. They're not getting taller, fatter, shorter or slimmer. They're spirit beings that God created and they have been from time, from eternity past to eternity future. But we do know that they are mighty and they excel in strength. Psalms 103 verse 20 tells us that, okay? There are two, three orders, if you like. Is it three or two? Let me call it two orders. There are two orders of angels that we see from the scriptures. There are seraphims and there are cherubims. Two orders of angels, all right? They obviously have different functions because we always see them around the throne of God, all right? But then there are archangels as well. Archangels simply means uh, angels that are senior to the regular band of angels. And there are only three mentioned in scriptures. So if you are seeing Uriel and Raphael and Mimo and whatever, I don't know where people came up with that. I am satisfied with the revelation that's in the Bible. Somebody called me and asked me um, about the book of the book of what was it? I don't even remember because I just, I just deleted it from my mind. Have you finished reading the Bible? That you're interested in the seven books of Moses or you're interested in, in the book of Thaddeus or in the book of whoever? Have you finished reading the Bible? Have you finished understanding the canon of scriptures before you're looking for additional whatever? Anybody can write a book. But is it every book that you should read and that you should do what is written in it? Okay, three archangels mentioned in scripture. One, Michael, he's the warring angel. We know that from Daniel, I think it's chapter 10, and also from Revelation chapter 12. He's the warring angel. Every time there's a fight, Michael is there. Okay, the second angel is Gabriel. And I tongue-in-cheek call him, called him the minister for information because he's the one God would always send. God sent him to Mary to tell her that she would uh, be with child, even though a man had never touched her. God sent him to Elizabeth. All right. So um, he's mentioned by name as well, Gabriel. He's the one who takes uh, messages uh, around. He's also mentioned in Daniel chapter 10, when he was telling da Daniel, he said, Daniel, from the first day you prayed, God sent me with you. But the prince over Persia withstood me. Now, when the Bible says the prince over Persia withstood an angel, I'm sure you know the prince over Persia is not a human being because no human being can withstand an angel. 
And that lends credence to what we saw and studied yesterday in chapter 9, that there are princes, principalities, powers, rulers of darkness over localities, over cities, over the places that we live in. So don't just think I'm driving home. There's a prince over that area that you should be exerting authority over. Glory to God. All right? And the third one is Lucifer. He's mentioned in Ezekiel, and we're going to come uh, in contact with him uh, later on in the book of Ezekiel. I think it's Ezekiel 28. He's mentioned. He's also mentioned in uh, Isaiah. All right. He was the praise and worship leader in heaven. He led the angels in worship before Almighty God until the Bible tells us iniquity was found in him. Because he sat down and he said, why is God being worshipped? Why am I not being worshipped? I'm going to uh, uh, go and occupy God's seat. And in essence, that's what he said. So there was rebellion in heaven. He convinced one third of the angels to follow him. And this is all in scripture. When we get to the book of Revelation, you will see. He convinced a third of the angels in heaven to, to join him in insurrection against Almighty God. And God told Michael to deal with him. And Michael kicked him out of heaven. And Jesus said in Luke 10, 18, Behold, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. All right? But we'll piece all together and you'll have clarity and understanding when we get there. Praise God. Um, what else? He said, uh, verse 12, their whole body and their backs and their hands, their wings and the wheels were full of eyes round about. That's why I think these things that he's referring to as wheels not Micah, Michael. Michael, the warring angel, the archangel. Three archangels mentioned in the Bible. Michael, M-I-C-H-A-E-L. Michael, Gabriel, and Lucifer, who became Satan, the adversary of God. Pastor Moore, do you, uh, do you mind telling us the other two you just said? The other two? Yeah, you said it was two types. Two orders, two orders of angels. It's like in the military where you have the Marine and you have the Navy. You can say the US military has four orders. You have the Army, you have the Marines, you have the Air Force, and you have what's the fourth one, the Navy. Do you understand my example? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, there are two orders of angels, cherubims and seraphims. And then there are three archangels. There were three archangels. Lucifer is no longer an archangel. Michael, Gabriel, and Lucifer before he fell. So as I was saying in verse 12, he said the wheels and, the, and, and their whole body, these are the angels, the, the uh, cherubims that he saw. And their whole body and their backs and their hands and their wings and the wheels were full of eyes round about. Even the wheels that they four had. That's why I don't think it's wheels like you and I know wheels. All right? I think it's something else. And if the scriptures are silent about it, we receive it by faith. Do not, child of God, do not believe what you cannot substantiate with scriptures. If someone tells you thus and such, tell them to show you in the Bible. If it's not there, set it aside. Glory to God. He continues to describe them. Everyone had four faces. First face was uh, of a cherub. Second face was a man. Third of a lion. Fourth was an eagle. This man couldn't describe what he was seeing. That's my conclusion on the whole matter. All right. So he tells us all over again what he saw uh, in the initial chapters of the book. And uh, like I said to you, it's not relevant to my salvation. Uh, I've confessed Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I believe in my heart that God raised him from, from the dead for my justification. And by his blood, I'm saved. And that's what's relevant. And I'm trying to walk as best I can in his ways so that when he comes back for me, I'll be ready to go. And if it's death that closes my eyes, I'm not afraid. To be absent in my body is to be present with the Lord. 
That's what's relevant, and that's what I am striving to attain. Praise God. Any questions on chapter 10? Pastor Mo, sorry, I have a question. You know how when, um, what is this, Isaiah um, had the encounter with the Lord in the temple, and then Isaiah, he was like, the, yes, sorry, then um, he said, um, what is me? I am a man of unclean lips. And then the angel came and put um, a call. burning coal to his lips. So that is purification. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that example. It really drives on the point I was making initially that fire is not necessarily to punish. Fire is also to purify. And the reference there is Isaiah chapter 6. You can go and look it up. Okay, then the Any second other question. Sorry, okay, the go second ahead. Thing I had, the second one I um, had, I, you said it's not really my book. In Daniel 10, in Isaiah, like the description of the angels is very, very similar. So I wonder where we now, like the description of the angels in all those cases is very, very um, similar. And every time somebody had an encounter with an angel, they fell face down. Mm -hmm. Like they fell face down. So I, I was just wondering like, where have we now perverted? Because most people, if you ask them what does an angel look like, they will tell you it looks like a fat baby, an overweight baby with little wings. That's what most people think of a description as an angel, you know. And even when, what's his name, Eli Elijah, his servant was like, ah, the, uh, the king of Samaria has come up against us. And Elijah prayed and said, let Elijah pray, said, open his eyes, let him see that the ones that are with us. So it's like, why would somebody deliberately paint a baby as an angel? His name is Satan the devil. That's why. <laughs> he has to pervert the things of God to make it of non-effect, that's his ministry. And unfortunately, man buys into that nonsense because they will not study the word of God. Even in churches today, how many places, how many churches do you know where the word of God is being studied the way we're doing? Not very many churches do it. I, I've been to several churches. I've visited several churches. There are Sunday services, the exact same thing Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. And even when they have midweek fellowship, when we used to have midweek fellowship before this pandemic nonsense, it was a replica of Sunday. It wasn't any different. When I gave my heart to the Lord in the mid 70s, midweek service was Bible study. It was this kind of thing that we're doing. We sat and we studied the Bible. It was different from Sunday service where we came to worship. But now it's, it's Wednesday is the exact replica of Sunday or Tuesday or whenever that they have their midweek fellowship. And like I say, it's only a mad scientist that goes into the lab, does the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. He's looking for a different result, but he won't change any variable. He'll be there till eternity. We've got to know the word. We just must. There's a reason why God preserved the Bible. It's the most persecuted book on the face of the earth. If there was one book the devil could get rid of, it would be the Bible. But God has supernaturally preserved it all this while. And they've said all kinds of things about it. All right? And no matter what they say, it still continues to be what it is, the word of God. To the extent that it changes the natural, no one can tell me that this book is not supernatural. So thank you for those uh, two examples. They're quite apropos. Any other comments? All right, chapter 11. Moreover, the spirit lifted me up and brought me unto the east gate of the Lord's house, which looked eastward, and behold, at the door of the gate, five and twenty men, among whom I saw Jaazaniah, the son of Azur, and Pelatiah, the son of Beniah, princes of the people. Then said he unto me, son of man, these are the men that devise mischief and give wicked counsel in this city, which say it is not near. Let us build houses. This city is the cauldron and we be the flesh. Therefore prophesy against them. Prophesy, O son of man. And the spirit of the Lord fell upon me and said unto me, Speak, thus saith the Lord. Thus have ye said, O house of Israel, for I know the things that come into your mind, every one of them. 
ye have multiplied your slain in the city, and ye have filled the streets thereof with the slain. Therefore, thus said the Lord God, your slain whom ye have laid in the midst of it, they are the flesh in this city, and this city is the cauldron. But I will bring you forth out of the midst of it. Ye have feared the sword, and I will bring a sword upon you, said the Lord. And I will bring you out of the midst thereof and deliver you unto the hands of strangers. And I will execute judgments among you. Ye shall fall by the sword. I will judge you in the, judge you in the border of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. This city shall not be your cauldron. Neither shall ye be the flesh in the midst thereof. But I will judge you in the border of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. For ye have not walked in my statutes neither executed my judgments, but have done after the manners of the heathen that are round about you. And it came to pass when I prophesied that Pelatiah the son of Beniah died. Then fell I down upon my face and cried with a loud voice and said, Ah, Lord God, wilt thou make a full end of the remnant of Israel? Again the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, thy brethren, even thy brethren, the men of thy kindred, and all the house of Israel, holy, are they unto whom the inhabitants of Jerusalem have said, Get you far from the Lord, unto us in this land, given in possession. Therefore say, thus saith the Lord God, Although I have cast them off, far off among the heathen, and although I have scattered them among the countries, yet will I be to them as a little sanctuary in the countries where they shall come. Therefore say, thus saith the Lord God, I will even gather you from the people and assemble you out of the countries where ye have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. And they shall come hither, and they shall take away all the detestable things thereof and all the abominations thereof from thence. And I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within you, and I will take the stony heart out of their flesh and will give them an heart of flesh, that they may walk in my statutes, and keep my ordinances and do them, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. But as for them whose heart walketh after the heart of their detestable things and their abominations, I will recompense their way upon their own heads, saith the Lord. De then did the cherubims lift up their wings and the wheels beside them, and the glory of the God of Israel was over above them. And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood upon the mountain which is on the east side of the city. Afterwards, the Spirit took me up and brought me in a vision by the Spirit of God into Chaldea, to them of the captivity. So the vision that I had seen went up from me. Then I speak unto them of the captivity, all the things that the Lord had showed me. All right. Again, uh, Ezekiel continues to see as the Lord opened his inner eyes. This time, God lifted him up in the spirit. He was in Babylon. Don't forget that. God lifted him out of his body. He had a body, uh, out of body experience. This is where the real truth of the word of God is. Every other thing out there is folks through the devil replicating what God does. Okay? Because you see people who do uh, trans transcendental meditation or whatever that they call it. I, I don't even know how they call it, but something like that. You see all kinds of crazy things. You see people who project out of their body, astral projection. Those things are evil. Stay away from them. They are satanic replication of the things that God does with his people and for his people. Ezekiel is a prophet of Almighty God. By the Spirit of God, he's clear. He said, the Spirit lifted me up. By the Spirit of God, God took him out of his body and took him to Jerusalem. He was in Babylon. And this buttresses the truth that I continue to share with you, that your body is not you. What you're looking at right now, that I've bathed this morning and put makeup on and put some nice clothes on is not me. It's the house I live in. The moment I leave it, it's going to drop to the ground lifeless. That's the reason why it does not tell me 
the spirit being what to do. And I don't cater to it. Does it resist me? Yes, it does. I can go two days and not eat. I do it all the time. Not because I'm fasting. I'm just someone who doesn't like food. As long as I'm drinking, I'm fine. Water, juice, whatever. I don't have to eat. I may eat peanuts. I may eat uh, crisps or whatever, chips or whatever. I don't really care for food. But the day I decide I'm going to fast, by the time it's 10 o'clock, I want to die. I resist it, two o'clock, it comes back. I resist it, four o'clock, it comes back. It's like that every time. And I've been fasting for decades because the flesh doesn't want to do what the spirit wants to do. So all of those things that you see people doing, I'm telling you, it's not all the glitters that is gold. And it's not everything that is supernatural that is from God. There are two spiritual kingdoms. Colossians chapter one tells us that. I think it's verse 12. He says he has translated us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his son. There are two spiritual kingdoms. One, Jesus Christ is Lord. The other, Satan says he's Lord. So don't think because it's supernatural or it's something that is inexplicable that it's from God. It's not necessarily from God. You have to know the word because the word is the final arbiter. It's the judge. If you look at it through the lenses of scriptures and it doesn't measure up, chuck it. It's not God. All right? He says, the spirit lifted me up and brought me into the east gate of the Lord's house. The real him living inside the body. The body is in Babylon. But God takes him in the spirit to uh, uh, um, Jerusalem for to show him this vision. There are counterfeits out there, guys. And my famous example, if I give you a $7 bill, will you take it from me? Talk to me. Well, no, no, it's not no, real. No. 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 You won't take a $7 bill because you know there is no $7 bill. Satan would be stupid to try and counterfeit what doesn't exist. But if I counterfeited a $10 bill, a $5 bill, a $20, $50, $100 bill, and I gave it to you, you most likely will take it. Except if you have that pen that you can scratch it with and you, you can tell whether it's counterfeit or not. Or you have the purple light that you put it under, the violet light that you put it under. He counterfeits the original to deceive. That's the greatest power of the enemy, deception. That's what he did to Eve in the Garden of Eden. That began all the problem that you and I are dealing with today. But well, thanks be to the Lord Jesus Christ who has delivered us from the body of death. It was an identity crisis. Eve did not know who she was. He comes to question the word of God in your life. Did God really say? That's what he said to Eve. And he said, yeah, God said we shouldn't eat it. We shouldn't touch it. We shouldn't come near it. God didn't say all that. God just said, don't eat it. You, they could have climbed the tree. They could have picnicked under the tree. They could have broken his branches for fire. They could have made uh, uh, tea out of his leaves. They could have done anything. God said, don't eat the fruit from it. And then Satan said to her, God knows the day you eat it, you will be like him. Stupid. She just said to him, I, I'm already like him. Hello. I don't need a piece of fruit to tell me that I'm already like him. I'm made in his image and likeness. It was an identity crisis. And if you don't know who you are in Christ, he will continue to fool you. That's why knowledge is necessary. And then applied knowledge is the height of it. So God takes him away. God shows him the perpetrators of this nonsense. That's going on in Israel. That's why you just cannot go to any church or submit yourself to any church. You've got to know God has called you to that place. You've got to know God has called you to that church. He's called you to serve the said person. He's call, called you to bring your gifts and your talents and your abilities, your time, your treasure, and your talents. Like my pastor would say, God 
says, bring those to the body so that with every joint supplying what is necessary, the body is fitly joined and it grows up in Christ. That is church. It's not choreography or, or stand here, step here, move here. 12 o'clock, it's over. 12.10, it's over. 12, 12, no, that's not church. You box God when you do that. If he wants us to remain in church for the next five hours, why not? If he has something to do in us that's going to take five hours, why not? Why ever not? Glory to God. So God shows him the people that are misleading the children of Israel. All right? He says, son of man, these are the men that devise mischief and give wicked counsel in this city. Telling them peace and safety. Everything is fine. Don't you worry about it when there is impending danger. Anyone who lies to you does not love you. That's the truth. Anyone who tells you the truth, even though it's bitter, that person cares for your soul. All right? And so God tells him to prophesy against them. And the spirit of the Lord fell upon him. And he began to prophesy. Look at verse 5. It says, thus have you said, O house of Israel. <laughs> the things you're saying, the lies that these false prophets are telling you, these fake priests are telling you, and that you're believing, God is saying to them in verse 5, I know the things that come into your mind, every one of them. This is why in 2 Corinthians, I think it is uh, chapter 10, verse 5. If it's not second, it's first. One of the Corinthian letters. But it's definitely chapter 10, verse 5. It says, take captive every imagination and bring it to the obedience of Christ. You, listen to me, child of God. You control your thoughts by introducing to your mind what you want to think. I'll say that again. You control your thoughts by introducing to your mind what you want to think. That is where one of your five spiritual senses come into play. There are five spiritual senses that you have. It's prayer, it's praise, it's worship, it's faith and it's meditation, five of them. Prayer, praise, worship, faith, meditation. The way to control your mind is through meditation. And meditation is not, um, no. Meditation is not you kneeling down or sitting down, feet crossed, and your, 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 your thumb is touching your index finger and you're, and you're closing your eyes and you're doing, um, that's not meditation, that's nonsense. Any religion or any discipline that tells you to empty your mind is dangerous. At no time should you give up control of your mind to anybody. God tells you to meditate, but he gives you content so that your mind is not out there, subject to every wind of doctrine, subject to every lie, subject to every new phase and every new, new, new whatever. Joshua chapter 1 verse 8, it says, this book of the law must not depart from before your eyes. You must be careful to meditate in it. Content. You meditate on the word of God. That's how you control your thoughts. So I am broke. And the month has ended. My rent is due. My car note is due. My phone bills are due. And all of my bills for the month is like 5,000. I look in my bank account and I have 1,300. You know I will be afraid. Fear will come. Worry will come. Concern will come. Those are the natural reactions to that situation. But I control my mind. Rather than dwell on 
what I see, which I can't help. I begin to control my mind with the word of God. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. It says, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are of good report, if, there, if it's praiseworthy, if it has any virtue, think on those things. So I begin to think of the goodness of God. I think of the time that when my back, when my back was to the wall and I could not meet my bills and it came through for me. I think of the time where somebody out of the blues just sent me a check. I begin to think on those things and I talk to him. I said, Lord, I have 1300. My bill is 5,000. I will not worry because the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. You are, you are a father and you are a loving father and you know that I have need of this. I begin to think, Philippians 4.19, my God supplies all of my needs, all of my needs, according to Chase, no, according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Therefore, Lord, as I meditate on this scripture, I ask that you will supply this need. Ideas will begin to come. Your thoughts will be productive. You get on the phone, if you're in the business, you get on the phone, you begin to prospect. That's how you control your mind. Introduce to it what you want it to think. Don't just leave it. Psychologists call it tabula rasa. There's the school of thought in psychology that believes we came with our minds blank. I don't know, I'm not a psychologist and I'm not God, whether I was blank or not. But I've been writing on my, on my mind ever since I was conscious enough to do it. I write on my mind what I want my mind to think. That's why I can live alone and I'm not fearful. That's why somebody pulled a gun on me right in my face and I told him, I said, shoot. My late daughter was sitting by me, Valerie. I said, shoot, you'll be surprised that the hammer will jam. He looked at me and said, mad woman. I said, who's mad, me or you? I drove her from the place before fear settled on me and I rebuked it. My daughter said to me, mom, I knew you were crazy, but I didn't know you were this crazy. Why? Because my life is in God's hands. You cannot take it unless he allows it. Even if you shoot me in the head and the bullet is lodged in my brain, if God says I will live, I will live. Praise God. God says, I know everything that comes into your mind. Control your mind. Don't let it run away. Don't let it think stupid thoughts. Don't let it think thoughts that's going to make you worry, that's going to make you fret. So people leave the business. Praise God. Bless them and release them. More are coming. Why am I going to worry about the person who's left me? The Bible says in one of the little Johns at the back, I'm not sure which one of them now. He said they went from amongst us because they were never a part of us. Somebody Google it, it's a scripture. So you live, I believe Bible fellowship, I will pray for you, I will bless you and I will release you. What you have learned while you were here will stay with you because it's the word of God. That's why I don't care whether my church is five or five million. It's not about numbers. Praise God. Control your mind. And God continues to talk and, and show him the, the vision of, of all the nonsense that these false prophets were doing. And God was reversing everything that they were saying that, oh, no, we're going to be the flesh in the, uh, the, the, in the, the city, the cauldron, and we are the flesh, or whatever nonsense they were saying. And God said, no, it's not going to be like that. All right? Verse, verse uh, 12, you shall know that I am the Lord, for you have not walked in my statutes, you have not executed my judgments, what you have done after the manner of the heathens around you. Child of God, we still have heathens around us. Yes, we're not running about in raffia skirts and carrying spears and screaming and yelling, but we still have heathens around us, people who do not believe God, people who believe other things, and they will advance strong reasons why they believe what they believe. And if you didn't know who you were in Christ and you didn't know the word of God, you will be almost persuaded, like Paul, like like uh, Paul, who 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 made a strong case for the Lord Jesus Christ. I think it, it was when he was 
on trial in Rome. It's in the book of Acts somewhere. And, and the, the governor said, you almost convinced me to become a Christian. It's somewhere in the book of Acts. You can find it. All right. There are heathens around us. That's why we are light and we are salt. We are the ones that are supposed to affect them and change them and point them to the path of salvation. Glory to God. <clears throat> and, and as he prophesied, verse 13, the Bible says, as, as, and it came to pass when I prophesied that Pelatiah, the son of Beniah, died. All right? He had told us who uh, Pelatiah and Beniah were in verse 1, right? Behold, at the door of the gate, five and twenty men, among whom I saw Jazaniah, the son of Azur, Pelatiah, the son of Beniah, princes of the people. These were, these were chief people among the children of Israel. And as he prophesied, the Bible says Pelatiah, who is the son of Beniah, one of the 25 people that he saw in verse 1, fell down and died. And I pray today that every false doctrine that you have ever listened to or believed, that they will die in you today in the name of the Lord Jesus. That you will come to the knowledge of the truth of the word of the Son of God. That you may walk in the fullness, in the power, and in the authority of who you are in Christ Jesus. Any thoughts, any questions? Let me mention some more things uh, in verse, uh, yeah, verse 16. God is still speaking and dealing with, uh, with um, Ezekiel. He says, therefore say, thus saith the Lord God, although I have cast them off, cast them far off among the heathen, and although I have scattered them among the countries, yet will I be to them as a little sanctuary in the countries where they shall come. Indeed, we see that God scattered the children of Israel because you have Polish Jews, American Jews, uh, uh, British Jews, uh, Ethiopian Jews. They've even found relics in Nigeria, in Eastern Nigeria, of the presence of Jewish culture. So God did scatter them. His word is true. This is something Ezekiel wrote when. All right. Thank God for the, uh, the discipline of archaeology and all the stuff that they're discovering. And I'm going to talk about Ron Wyatt again. Go and watch his videos on YouTube. Ron Wyatt went to be with the Lord, I want to say in 1999 or thereabouts. He discovered the Ark of the Covenant. They went and they measured what they saw in Turkey. Is the exact measurement of what's in the Bible. And it was found on Mount Ararat. Now, if the Bible is not true, and if there's no Ark of the Covenant, then someone has to explain to me who rode a boat to the top of Mount Ararat. I need to know that. All right? God did scatter them. But he said, I'm going to be a sanctuary to them. They will not be totally consumed. And look at the Jewish people amongst us today. If there's one people group that have maintained their culture and refuse to imbibe any other culture, it's them. They teach their children after their children after their children. Although there are a whole bunch of them in Hollywood and all over the place who don't even remember that they're Jews. It's the only people group who have spoken the same language for over 3,000 years. Okay, God says, I will be a little sanctuary. I will preserve a remnant. God always, always has a remnant. Always. Where truth will be spoken and truth will be taught. Okay, then he goes on to say, um, in verse 17, uh, Thus said the Lord God, I will even gather you from the people and assemble you out of the countries where you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. Guys, the word of God is true. On the 14th of May, 1948, the United Nations, actually on the 29th of November, 1947, they decided that they should give Israel their land back. And on May 14th, 1948, 
they all went back home and they're still going back home now. Although it's a lot, lot smaller than what gave them initially because God gave, Saudi Arabia was part of Israel all the way down to Ethiopia and even West Africa because Ethiopia was, was it was so wide. It wasn't just in East Africa. It was all the way to West Africa. God said, I will give you back your land and he did exactly that in our time uh, uh, frame, all right? Um, and then he said, they will come, they will take away all the detestable things because he will reestablish his covenant and his relationship with them. Verse 19, I will give them one heart. I will put a new spirit within them. I will take the stony heart out of their flesh and I will give them a heart that's tender, a heart that wants to seek God, a heart that wants to know God, a heart that wants to walk after the precepts, the statutes, the judgments, and the commandments of God. God wants willing vessels. Willing vessels. He's not God if he forces me to love him. He becomes my God because he gave me the free will to choose him. And I choose him. Okay? I, I will do that. I will give them a heart of flesh, verse 20, that they may walk in my statutes, keep my ordinances, and do them. You have to do the word of God. There are nine ways we handle the word of God. And I don't remember all nine, but it's somewhere in our chat. Uh, if someone would scroll back and look for it and repost it, that would be great. We read the word. We speak the word. We hear the word. We meditate on the word. Um, there's nine of them. Okay. It says, I will, they shall be my people and I will be their God. But as for the others who refuse, in spite of everything that I've said and done concerning them, I will recompense them their way, the way they have chosen upon their own heads. All right. So that's important for us to also note. Glory to God. And then the cherubims, uh, of course, they took off and uh, he came out of the vision. And then he, he said in verse 25, he shared with them of captivity, the children of Israel that were in captivity in Babylon. He shared with them all the vision that he saw. Any questions, any thoughts? Pastor, going uh, back yeah. to what you were saying um, earlier about um, having faith in the finance and believe in him for it. Um, You're breaking up. I can't hear you. I just struggle a lot with that. You're sounding robotic. And uh, can you, I'm in the mountains. Can you hear me? Uh, okay, it's better now. Okay, so going back to what you were saying about believing him for the finances, um, I used to struggle a lot with that. And I just, I didn't have the faith. I was just like, no, I need to see it. You know, I'm like, no, Lord, like, you know, I don't have the money. I can't do this. And I just, I just couldn't wrap my head around um, believing that I don't have it, but I'm going to have it. Um, but it was crazy every time I needed stop. Stop. to Let pay me for stop something. You. Let me stop you right there. You said believing I don't have it but I'm going to have it. That's not belief. Right. And that's not, that's not faith. Right. That's not, that, I, I used to struggle so much with that. I just couldn't, it was just like, no, like I need to see it. I need to feel it. And then time after time, God was super faithful. Like I would have it. There were days I wouldn't have food, but he'll feed me. I wouldn't have money, but he'll, you know, bring the way, pay for the things. Maybe not all the time give me the money to pay for it, but he will pay it. And I mean, oof, he very faithfully um, and gracefully just taught me that he is my provider, that if I trust him, he will provide. And nowadays, okay. if I don't, if I don't focus, if I'm not paying attention, I will start falling back into that fear. And then I'm like, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? And the moment I start like, overthinking i start feeling the fear 
I'm like, nope, my God's provided for me. My God's going to keep providing. And and I just go back into that faith. And oof, he has never failed me yet. And he will never fail me. So, amen. 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 What a testimony. Let me tell you something, guys. See that paper? That $1, $5, $10, $20, $50, $100 bill? And uh, all the others that you and I just hear about, not sure if it's in existence, the $1,000 bill, um, <clears throat> that's not money. So when you fret when you don't have it, it means you're ignorant. That piece of paper is not money. It's just something that you and I have agreed to attach value to so that we can exchange goods and services. That's not money. So the absence of it or the presence of it in your pocket doesn't mean you have money or you don't have money. I'll give you a quick example that you probably don't think about, but it's real. Do you have a credit card? All right. Yeah. I have a card. The limit on it is $10,000. Do I have $10,000 cash? No but I have a card that will allow me to spend $10,000 without the piece of paper in my hand. So it would be silly of me to panic because I look in my pocket and I don't have those bill folds, uh, th those bills, sorry. You need to see things for what they really and truly are. So, I, I, I'm proud of you and I'm proud of your testimony that you know how to bring your back, bring yourself back to the right course when Satan wants to start to play with your mind. You don't have the money. You can't do it. That, this, that, and the other. There's a timing to all of the things that God has asked us to do anyway. You know? If, if someone wants me to go to the UK now to do something for them, will I use my money to buy the ticket? No. You want me to go to UK to get something done for you. You buy my ticket to fly to UK. So if God wants me to do something, he will provide. If he has not provided, but he's told me, I want you to do this, but he has not brought the provision, it means it's not time. Because when the time comes, he will provide. So bless God for that testimony. Any other thoughts? Uh, yeah, who was that person that you said to watch on YouTube? Was it Ron Wick? You said Ron Wyatt, W Y A W T. Ron Wyatt. He he discovered the exact spot of the crossing of the uh, children of Israel uh, and Pharaoh's pursuit of them in the Red Sea because at the bottom of that sea, at the exact spot, there is still um, wheel shaped fossils under the under the sea that you know you can tell it's a wheel from a chariot all of these things the pictures are there he discovered uh, the ark of the covenant the, uh, the, the real ark of the covenant where the, the presence the shekinah glory of god still is he, he when he got there there were two angels guarding it you need to go and watch it <laughs> We're recording. Let me stop the recording. Father, thank you for your word. We're grateful, as always, that you have taught us. Help us to keep in remembrance that which we have learned, that we may walk in the light of it. In Jesus' name, amen.